Hi, I'm Karen, and this is The Learning Circuit, where we learn about basic electronics. Today, we're going to learn about the basic tools of soldering. In past episodes, I've shown you tools and techniques needed to make projects that have temporary electrical connections. In electronics, if you want permanent connections, use a process called soldering. For today's episode, I've invited on one of the most experienced solderers I know, Ben Heckendorn. Hey, Ben. It turns out I'm in the same shop. <laughs> so what are we talking about today, Karen? We're talking about soldering tools. So oh. let's first talk about the basic tools that you need. The main soldering tools that you have as options are your soldering pencil, that's just the standalone unit. Yeah. And soldering stations. Ah, uh, yes. Which I like the, this weller. It's nice and nice heavy. nice fancy yeah. ones. So if you're going to start soldering and you have a low budget or if you're not really sure if you want to dump a bunch of money into it, you can right. start with a cheap handheld soldering iron. Right. That's what most people usually are familiar with when they mm -hmm. start. But as far as cheap goes, you don't want to go too cheap. Yeah. So when you're looking at these, they start at what? Like 15 watts and like this one goes yeah. up to, this one's an 80 watt. Yeah. 80 watts probably bigger than you'd want to use for electronics. I would say... 20 to 40 is probably the sweet spot. Yeah. Uh, so what she means by wattage is basically how much uh, current it draws, which also tells you how much power it has in order to be able to melt solder. And obviously the higher the wattage, the more solder it can melt or the faster it will melt it. So one thing you want to look for is make sure that your plug for your soldering iron has a ground pin. This one doesn't. If you're in the US, you want to plug like this. If you're in another country, Sorry, I'm not familiar with your plugs, but look for one with the ground pin. Yeah, I mean, this, this Weller doesn't have one, and it's not gonna be the end of the world, but it's usually a good thing to look for. Uh, the rule of thumb I've heard is that if a device has exposed metal, then it's good for it to have a grounded plug because that allows static to discharge into the earth instead of building up on your tool. Mm -hmm. So why would you wanna get one of these? Well, they're cheaper, yeah. um, they're smaller, so they're easier to store. Um, they tend to come with these little stands, which if you're going to be using one of these, you want to make sure you're always using, don't set it down on the table, use a stand. Um, but what are some of the drawbacks? The drawbacks to these? Well, mm -hmm. they don't have a variable temperature control. Right. I mean, it's like basically you plug it in and it, whatever heat it goes up to, that's all you're going to have. Mm -hmm. That could change in other countries, though, because they have higher voltages. But True. obviously this has a U.S. plug on it. Uh, yeah, because our, our AC is 110, and then there's a lot of countries where it's 220. It's basically a double. That's why like if you take your laptop, even if it's compatible with 220, your power brick will get hotter if you charge it in other countries because there's more uh, voltage coming into it to mm -hmm. the start. All right, let's talk about our bread and butter soldering stations. Yeah, it looks like we have three different models to look at. We do. So one of the nice things about soldering stations is that you always have a place to put your soldering iron. Mm -hmm. And then a lot of them come with a place to put uh, a sponge or a brass pad. Yeah, it looks like we have uh, two sponges and this one has a brass pad. Mm -hmm. And we can talk about those a little bit later. Mm -hmm. These are the different degrees of fancy ah, that you can degrees. get. Degrees. Ha ha. Ha ha ha. So this one, um, they all have some sort of temperature control, but yes. how fine that is will depend on how nice the model is. Right. So this one has a simple control where it's just a knob that goes from you know yellow up to red. So you don't necessarily know exactly how hot it is. You don't know the exact temperature. Um, the temperature is red. So then next, uh, here's another one where it actually has a digital display. Mm -hmm. um, and this model's kind of nice because it gives oh, yeah. you three automatic set, like oh, yeah, this one three preset well, temperatures. Yeah. Um, but it also allows you to do fine-tuning of the temperature. Oh, there's a transformer in it. See, that's good because the transformer allows you to have higher current faster. Mm -hmm. Basically allows it to heat up quickly. And as you this can one probably see doesn't. and smell, this one yep. heats up pretty quickly. Like, that's already up to temperature. What's that line from Jurassic Park? Is that heavy? Then it's expensive. Put it away. <laughs> uh, but like in, in soldering that's irons, great. heavy means that it has a nice transformer in it, which is going to get you up to temperature quickly. So heavy, it, yes, it also means it costs more, but it also means it's better. Mm -hmm. So if you're looking at a soldering station, things to consider are obviously price. And then do you prefer a digital readout? Um, what kind of holder and extra little features? You know, Do you want this kind of holder that holder yeah so uh yeah i like it when i know what the temperature is mm -hmm. uh the one that i use over on my desk actually just has a knob but it's a digital knob so it's electronic but you use a knob to change the temperature it doesn't actually have presets oh okay so i don't know, actually know why i don't use this one i think i think i like the tip options better with my other weller than this one this one is 
One, we just move around the shop. It's kind of like our portable good weller station. Because um, normally I'll solder at around 500 Fahrenheit. Sometimes I'll bump it up to like 700 if I'm doing like desoldering or soldering larger things that require more heat. Mm -hmm. So my iron, I'm like, vit, vit, I'm turning the knob. But with these, you can just have like three presets on each one. Right. Because you're, most of the time you're gonna be doing the same things or you know a few of the same things. Mm -hmm. Once you've selected your soldering tool, you'll wanna make sure you get some spare tips. It's really important to have a good clean tip when soldering. And as a beginner, it's also easy to accidentally corrode and ruin your tips. And it's not just about replacing tips that have gone bad. You might want to have different tips for different applications, like a finer point tip for detailed work or a larger tip to transfer more heat quickly. Yeah, Ben. So like Felix recently has been using this tip which is tapered and it's kind of like a blade. Mm -hmm. um, and it's really nice because there's more surface area. Right. So you can kind of get in there and it heats pads really well. So once you've chosen your soldering iron, you want to make sure that you get a tip that matches it. For example, this one has a piece that just drops in with a screw the piece that goes over it. Yep. Ben's is just a really short tip that has just a lip that gets ca caught by a capture nut. Yep, like this This right one's here. a little bit shorter. There are also ones that are threaded that screw in. And for example, on this one, it's got a set screw that holds it in place. Right. So when ordering your extra tips, you want to make sure you get one that matches the tool that you have. Yeah, and the tips can even vary wildly by manufacturer. Like these mm -hmm. Weller tips are completely incompatible with my Weller iron that I have on my desk. Right. We mentioned that keeping your soldering tip clean is important in soldering. So how do you do that? Well, there are two main products that you can use. You can get a sponge, which you can get damp, or you can get a brass pad. Now, what are the benefits and drawbacks of each of these? Well, uh, you know, I, I kind of like using a sponge myself yeah. because I feel that I know what's going on. Mm -hmm. Like if I've got, again, like I've got a chisel, I can go whoop, whoop, and I know I've got everything. Uh, with the brass pad, I don't know. I, I don't always feel like I'm getting everything scraped off. I can't see it come off. So I see. I actually prefer sponges. So this is Ben's sponge from his soldering iron. As you can tell it's very well used. <laughs> super gross. Sometimes you need a little bit more than a sponge or a brass pad to clean your tip. So let's talk about what you can use. There's actual tip tinner and cleaner out there, which gets your tip nice and shiny. You tend to use this when your tip gets a little clean. Yeah, it's kind of yeah. not the best way to do it, but this is just a tin of uh, flux. Mm -hmm. Well, because when you put flux on the tip, it'll also help it, uh, you know, adhere to the solder. Mm -hmm. So you just scrub it around in there when yeah, it's Yeah, it's also satisfying to stick the tip into the it flux. I had to. Sizzles a little. It's like, and then you yeah. see it melt and yeah. So solder didn't used to have flux in it. You used to have to use your solder and then add flux on the side, but now you can get solder that contains flux. It's called flux core. Yeah, in the olden days you might see someone like soldering uh, pipes and mm -hmm. they'll, they'll brush on the flux with a, one of those brushes kind of like rubber cement mm -hmm. and then they bring in the solder. But now the flux is inside of the solder. But the flux can also help clean your tip, which is why you use that. So what you can do is use flux core solder, just add a little bit of that solder to your tip and then clean it on your sponge or brass pad. And sometimes just that little bit of extra flux can help clean your tip. There are two main types of solder, leaded solder and lead-free solder. Now, leaded solder is kind of the old fashioned way to do it. And it's sometimes a little bit easier because lead has a lower melting point than the lead free solder. But there is a slight health risk because lead is not really good for you. So if you're going to be using leaded solder, you wanna make sure that you're not touching your face or like eating or drinking while you're using it. And you wanna make sure you always wash your hands when you're done. Yes, I, I even make sure I wash my hands after using leaded solder. And that's saying something. <laughs> well, and also um, leaded solder can't be used in, there's many countries that basically ban it. Mm -hmm. um, America doesn't, but you can't export it to Europe because Europe definitely cares about solder. So yeah. basically all consumer products have switched to lead-free solder so they can be used all over the world. But in America, at least, we, uh, we can still buy lead solder. Mm -hmm. Here's some very thin solder that Felix uses. Now this is ideal for doing very small jobs where you don't need a lot of solder because you can get it in those little fine spots. But if you're gonna be doing like through hole or something that requires a lot more solder, this mm -hmm. can get frustrating because it'll go fast and so you have to feed it really quickly. So you might wanna use something with a slightly bigger diameter. 
Well, thanks for coming on and talking about soldering tools and materials with me, Ben. No problem, Karen. And then I hear you have a soldering example episode coming up. Yes, I'm very excited about that. All right, well, maybe I'll come back and help with that one as well, because it turns out I have been soldering for many years and uh, I can help you out. Well, thanks for that. No problem. Do you have any tips about soldering or soldering tools that we missed? Or do you have a story to share about learning to solder? Tell us about them on the Element 14 community on element14.com forward slash the learning circuit. We'll see you next time.